Welcome everybody to a new edition of Dev Live, where we are bringing live speakers and partners who will join Dev Talks 2022. I'm Andrea Balac, and I'm happy to be here to explore the agenda of our large-scale conference. And today, together with Professor Setu Omar, who is Professor of Robotics and Director at Edinburgh Center of Robotics, we will explore more of what the uh, robotics means in this future, and also maybe uh, approach some controversial issues in terms of use of the robots in today's society. So welcome, Professor. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to uh, attend your talks for the first time, and uh, I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you. Uh, it's really an honor for us to have you here in, in our lineup of speakers. Um, so I want to approach a subject that is more related to your passion, the passion for artificial intelligence and robotics. So you have more than 20 years of experience working with robots. How it all started? Yeah, um, you make me sound very old, but uh, that's OK. Uh, um, so yeah, I think um, uh, right from when I was a kid, I was fascinated by um, things that move. So I had a passion for science. I had a passion for equations and numbers, but also uh, I'm, I was very keen on trying to uh, look and explore machines and devices that would change the state of the world. So uh, as opposed to uh, simulations or things in uh, like a game setting, I wanted to look and um, develop things, understand things, with machines that would change the state of the world. So my undergraduate degree was in computer science and applied maths, but really my passion for robotics started um, more in the postgraduate phase of my education, where I was very lucky enough, I was lucky enough to uh, get a scholarship to go to Tokyo uh, for my master's and PhD. And of course, as you know, Japan is the Mecca for, uh, for robotics and uh, they have a very long history of accepting robots uh, into the society, working with them. And so this was quite infectious. And for me, um, working with robots uh, and applying some of the knowledge that I gained in the basics of uh, machine learning and um, AI and computing to something as um, potentially quite old, because robotics is new, not new, but looking at it from a very different perspective, it became a passion. And that's what I've been following uh, for the rest of my life. So you talked about accepting robots in our daily lives. So my some many my some fear about this. How do you yeah. think uh, with the artificial intelligence will go? How far is uh, the future? Yeah, uh, and this is a question that is in everybody's mind when we develop new technology, um, whether it's robots, whether it's kind of social media based technology, whether it's kind of uh, face recognition, always, whenever we develop technology, there are uh, good users and bad users. Uh, we can, in theory, the two sides of the same coin. Um, so I think um, in answer to your sort of question of um, where does AI and robotics sit in today's society in terms of usefulness, in terms of its application, and in terms of uh, how threatening or non-threatening people may find it. Um, we have to go back to the history of why people uh, sort of you know, fear robots. And that has to obviously go to the science fiction uh, visions of um, humanoid robots um, having mind of its own and making decisions on their own uh, and uh, potentially doing things that are unexpected so uh, this this nicely brings us to the point of what is the current push in robotics and in my research uh, there is we, we clearly distinguish between what we call automation and autonomy so automation is something that people have been doing for, you know, for centuries um, about creating automation that can take a, a thing that you have to repeat in factories or in, in sort of some sort of manufacturing setting and create things that can repeat itself again and again, very accurately, very precisely without tiring. 
So this was an excellent example of how we can improve the labor conditions uh, by automation. Uh, however, the new wave of robotics is going away from pure automation to significant more autonomy. What that means is we are now trying to create technology where the robots are not only repeating the things um, as programmed, but being able to adapt, change its behavior. When I say behavior, uh, you shouldn't think of behavior as in human behavior, but change its actions, adapts its actions in response to a dynamic environment. So for example, if the exact location of something that you have to pick up changes, or if say there is a shadow, or if there is, um, uh, you, if you need to uh, operate in a slightly different environment, you need to think about a pedestrian setting for an autonomous driving car where the streets all look similar. They've got similar markings, but they're all different streets. So these are examples where the robots need to generalize. And that is why we are bringing in new machine learning algorithmic technologies, which enables or gives the ability of these robotic systems to use AI to change or adapt its behavior. And that's where a lot of the fear comes from. Um, people always worry that if the actions of the um, devices or machines are unpredictable at some stage, then um, you know how, how do we react to things when something goes wrong? And that's a very valid um, point. And this is where a lot of the work that I do with my other hat on at the Alan Turing Institute, as the director of the AI, the Alan Turing Institute, we are looking at developing technology that are morally and ethically um, transparent. They are verifiable and explainable. And uh, when something goes wrong, we are building designs of these systems that are by design um, explainable for, uh, from a causality point of view. So that is very important in developing technology. Okay, you you um, reminded us about your work. So, um, what part of your work project are you most proud of now, and why? Yeah, uh, it's it's like asking somebody who's your favorite kid, right? Uh, and so, I think um, I would say it's been a journey. So, um, if if I think about one piece of um, work that I am well known for around the world, it's it's about applying the latest development in machine learning so things like adaptive algorithms for online estimation and dynamics to real-time control of classical robotic systems so effectively changing the paradigm in terms of not just the kind of you know classical sort of um, sense um, so, so perceive um, plan act a pipeline and going around it in loop uh, we still have that, but in, incorporate a notion of adaptation into that uh, framework. So, um, and, and if I think about very specific projects, uh, one of the very high profile projects that we're involved in uh, is this collaboration with the NASA Johnson Space Center on um, uh, potential deployment of a humanoid or human-like robot, so anthropomorphic robots. Um, for working in environments that are built for humans. So things like the space station or settlement on moon and, and future potential missions to Mars. So these are environments that are built for humans, for human cohabitation, but uh, they are sometimes you have to do uh, operations or settings that are either too boring, too dangerous, or need maintenance when humans are not there. So. These are examples of robotic tasks which have to operate uh, in non-wheeled non environments. So with steps, uneven terrain. So you need bipedal, quadrupedal locomotion capabilities, for example. Um, we also need dexterous manipulation capabilities. So we now have lots of examples of robots with drones, for example, which are mapping the environment, going to construction sites, building a map in real time. But still, what is still uh, quite um, at the infancy, what's still missing in lots of this technology is the ability for these robotics technologies to interact with the environment, 
push and pull a button, turn a valve, um, do, do things in a robust fashion. And that is what we are trying to do with this project, uh, one of the high profile projects with NASA uh, on building capabilities in um, bipedal, quadrupedal platforms to not just sense and understand the world that it is that the robots are cohabiting the human with, human space with, but actually being able to take over and autonomously um, or semi-autonomously um, deliver a task like testing for um, you know uh, the, the the quality of the air, um, sort of cleaning up, um, making sure you can do maintenance tasks like uh, inserting, removing and inserting a new battery into a setup. So these are more mundane tasks that we don't find very hard to do, but getting a robotic system to do it, especially in a confined environment like space is, is, is quite a challenge. And that is one of our projects that we're um, working on. <laughs> you talked about the impressive part of your work. Um, I, I'm curious if, and if I may ask, what's the hardest part of your work? What's the most challenging? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question because uh, often uh, in, in some of these interviews or sort of, you know, presentations, um, we get a lot of hype about what the robotics or AI technology can do, but we don't always get the full picture of what is hard and where the failures are, are likely to happen and where should the technology be pushing. So I think uh, practitioners who get their hands dirty with the actual uh, robotic systems are the ones who can give you that insight. And, and we have learned it the hard way in the sense that building robotic systems are challenging, but they are only, I would say, 20 to 30 percent of the story. The rest uh, of the sort of 70, almost 70 percent of the work, uh, even if you have the best quality um, hardware in terms of actuators, sensors, the, 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 the remaining challenge is about how to get all of the systems to work together, uh, to gel together, to create a cohesive behavior. Um, and, and that is tough, um, especially it's tough when the robots have to interact with their environment. So let me try to sort of separate that. So, so far, a lot of robotic systems that have been developed and deployed in factories, they work in very constrained environments, very restricted environments where the interactions have been um, uh, so very, very much uh, orchestrated. Uh, they are not, there are very few unexpected uh, things. Um, in other cases, robots have worked in settings where they have to operate in free space and uh, the, the number of contacts it makes with the world um, in terms of, you know, uh, walking, picking up objects, uh, jumping, uh, those have been quite limited. It's mostly about robots sensing the world using cameras, sensors, um, uh, various kinds of multimodal sensors uh, to then feedback that information to the users and make them decisions. Um, so the real challenge um, that we are now tackling is in what we call multi-contact interactions. So humans, when we walk around and operate in our homes, we seamlessly use and exploit contacts. We don't avoid contacts, we exploit contacts when you're trying to say, uh, go to a bookshelf and pick a book and sort of place it somewhere else. Or if you're operating something in your kitchen or your bedroom, we are always uh, using the surfaces, using the contacts to more efficiently do things. Um, we yet don't have sophisticated algorithmic technologies that can do this with robotics um, in a very robust fashion. There are many examples in, in laboratories where we can see the cutting edge laboratories, including ours. We can show some nice demonstrations of robot flipping something or turning it over. But if you now let it loose in an, in an environment uh, which is, is cluttered, which is unpredictable, which has got ambiguities in its sensing and noise, and the um, so in particular, one of the areas that we are working on is how do we plan for rolling and sliding contacts. Um, so not just avoid contacts like the classical way uh, of, of solving motion planning, but exploit contacts like rolling and sliding contacts uh, to be able to do that. So 
one of the biggest tools for that is what we call optimal control and optimization. So a big area for work is in the area of optimization. But there's also a big role uh, for systems to play in, in what we call um, simulated environments. So you know, different languages, people use different languages in different settings. So some people call it digital twins. Some people call it um, sort of full physics simulation. But the, the bottom line is we want to improve our sim to real transfer um, research so that we don't always have to operate the robots to collect the data, but we can do a lot of the preliminary investigation in realistic physics simulations that we can learn a lot of things and then transfer that into real world uh, environments. So those are some of the biggest challenges we face. Okay, thanks for sharing that with us. So um, this year edition, we have a team in uh, artificial intelligence and innovation, humanity reimagine. Mm -hmm. So uh, you will be present on 8th of June on the main stage uh, with an opening keynote. Uh, can you make a short intro about the keynote and what you will present uh, with the audience? Um, absolutely. I, I'm really excited to do this because um, in, in most of my talks, I try to make my talks as engaging as possible so that the curiosity of the listener is aroused. So uh, a, a key, in my opinion, a key aim of a talk is, is not necessarily to understand all the details of how an implementation happens, but trying to get across the, the big challenges, the solutions that we are taking and the innovations that we are making to make that happen um, and get people to experience firsthand that innovation. So hopefully, if everything works out, I'm going to, I'm planning to get a, a live demo of a prosthetic hand with me, which is effectively um, um, a sort of uh, an interface between a human biomuscle signals. So reading live from the, um, the bioactivity of a human muscle and then operating a prosthetic hand uh, live with some what we call shared autonomy. So uh, I do want to spend a bit of time showing that live to get people the understanding of what I mean by um, autonomy, shared autonomy, you know, uh, machine learning applied to autonomy. Um, but also, I will talk about the latest developments in everything from representations for robotics. So uh, going away from classical Euclidean representations to Riemannian representations or some very, um, very innovative ways of representing the world around us. Uh, just to give you an example, um, if we start representing everything around us in the world by classical Euclidean you know, XYZ uh, coordinate frames, um, we will be probably not very efficient in scaling some of these uh, robotic applications to very challenging domains like um, uh, inside, if, if you want to send a snake robot, a brachioscopy robot inside our body um, or um, work in very cluttered environments. Instead, if we start using relational representations, uh, relational meaning how does uh, uh, one object relates to the other and how should a robot move in order to change the relationship. That makes the representation a lot more scalable. And so I'll talk about some of that. I will also talk about some of the um, advances we have made in perception, uh, in using multimodal perception, using LIDARs and cameras to sense the world. And more importantly, uh, we will. I will also focus on uh, some of the work that we've done in improving safety, inherent safety in robotic systems. So using what we call compliant actuation. So the use of, in, in very layman terms, it's the use of springs in between end effectors and actuators. So by, by attaching compliant systems in between, uh, you will make the robot inherently safe. It means if something fails or there's, there's some failure, uh, the robot will not be, it will give in when it interacts with people. But that makes the control and the um, uh, planning with those systems much harder. So those are the kind of challenges we are solving. So I will talk about all of these things. And I will also give some examples from three different domains. Uh, one domain uh, in, in the domain of um, robots working in extreme environments. So things like inspection, repair, maintenance of big uh, infrastructure like uh, our subway systems, your metro systems your nuclear 
power plants, things like that. Uh, the other domain is in the area of um, uh, space. I just briefly mentioned, uh, so in, in remote settings uh, where there's a transmission delay and we have to have significant autonomy on the robotic systems. And the last domain I will touch upon is healthcare. So we are doing some work in the use of robotics and AI in um, in, in healthcare, meaning we are using it for um, assisted living for people who are aging in their uh, for their care homes. We're also using it for um, improving the use of exoskeletons for people who've had a stroke or had a sports injury. So how do we improve that case? And also we are using it uh, using this concept of variable robots um, in industrial factory settings to help the alleviate injuries sports uh, sorry um, workers injuries in lifting heavy weights in factories during assembly and things like that so these are the kind of three domains application domains i will um, give exemplar equa is exemplar um, uh, sort of solutions in based on the technology i will develop and, and talk about yeah Okay, okay, thank you for the complex um, description. Uh, we are looking forward to, to it. I think all the developers will be present at your keynote because the IT community is really passionate about artificial intelligence, machine learning, all the technicalities behind robotics. So um, if you would like to share a message with the IT community, with the robotics enthusiasts maybe, um, please, um, Tell us more. Yeah, uh, I think uh, the IT community, in, in particular, people who um, have a good ethics of maintaining the code, so developing code in a way that is scalable, that is um, uh, kind of modular, scalable. Um, the use of well-documented code is is crucial for not just our community, the AI and robotics community, but but on a wider scale. So. I am really looking forward to interacting with some of the uh, people who come to your, your, your conference um, because they form the backbone of some of the successes that we um, you know, rely on uh, for our robotics and AI work. So if, if I look at the makeup of my team here in, in Edinburgh, um, we have, I would say, about half the people are people who have... Um, very good computing and coding skills um, on top of their fundamental basics uh, in say mathematics or, or, or physics and etc um, and there are other there's some other half of people working on core basic algorithms and theoretical developments uh, there are others working on design and mechanical engineering aspect of things so so coding and um, software engineering in particular is extremely important for complex systems like robots so i give you the example of nasa if you think about a mission that needs to tick every box because failure is not an option it's such an expensive thing you cannot um, you know recover from a failure very easily so in those systems good practices in software engineering um, becomes crucial for the success of anything that we test and finally, we also do things like unit tests, which are very similar to what software engineering folks are, are, are doing anyway. So unit tests are, are repeated tests that if you change something in the system, then we try to make sure that not just the algorithm works without core dumping, but actually the, the, the robots or the robotic systems um, are behaving in the way we expect it to do using some standard routines when you somebody or some part of the code is changed. So this practice uh, that are core to software development and software engineering um, is very relevant and runs all the way as an ethos in, in AI and robotics. Um, and the only other thing, last thing I want to add would be that uh, from an AI perspective, um, it becomes the duty of the people developing the technology to not just think about how effective the technology is, but also think about the social and ethical implications of the use of this technology going forward. So I would also very much like the community there to start thinking about um, how can we actively, not reactively, but proactively um, be able to um, 
you know, put some put some legal and ethical bindings around the use of technology so that the community as a whole it's not a subset of our uh, our uh, community or our um, civilization but uh, this wealth is spread more equitably uh, across more um, wider community so we need to make some active efforts to to ensure that uh, thank you for reminding us that failure is not an option. I think this is uh, uh, something that brings along a huge responsibility. So you in your role, you bear a huge responsibility and it looks very complex for the IT community and we are looking forward to, to be present at your keynote. Um, I think this is the end of our discussion. Thank you for joining us today and taking your time to accept our invitation. Uh, for those at home, there are uh, less than two months till the event, so DevTalks uh, 2022 is uh, coming closer to us. Join us and have a great day ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you.